Well, Chief, welcome to the broadcast. How are you doing today? Doing well. Thank you for having me. Now, that is a canned answer. How are you really doing with this job? You are the chief. I mean, you're tugged in every which way. How are you holding up, Ryan? Uh, you know, I, I made it through the first year, so that's a good thing. I've probably got a few more gray hairs, but, uh, you know, that, that that's all good. Uh, overall, you know, I've got a really good staff, and, uh, you know, there's certainly some challenges, and, and there's certainly a lot of demands on the position, but uh, one that I, I take on uh, willingly and something I'm uh, certainly proud to serve here as the chief of police. Is the job close to anything you expected? You were kind of watching the other chiefs, if you will, kind of close to them and the command staff and now that you're the chief was it what you expected some say when you get in these positions there's always something different that that you did not see coming down the pike yeah i think you know having grown up in this department for the last almost 23 years i think you know i had a pretty good idea of what goes on here in the department but there certainly is uh, something to be said for it's a little different perspective when you're uh you know, you're the one that's in charge of the department as the chief. So uh, I think, uh, again, relying on those folks that uh, they have that work with me here in the department to help keep me aware of things that are going on and uh, help me see any blind spots I may have and kind of keep me uh, pointed in the right direction for any potential challenges that may be coming up. But overall, I think it's been a good transition. Yeah. Was it frustrating to uh, have all of the experience that you had, you know, been in the department so long, to see outside folks be selected to be chief, like a Chief Diaz? Or do you guys say, well, those fresh eyes are may, well, may be needed in this position? How do you guys see it looking back? You know, I think every every time you get a, a new chief in, whether it's an inside or an outside chief, I think he or she brings uh, you know, certain qualities with them that, that others don't. Um, I think, you know, when you do have an outside chief that comes in, I think they do provide a, a different level of perspective that maybe some of us who, again, have been born and raised, so to speak, in this department may not always see. So it's good to get an outside perspective sometimes. I think trying to balance those things is, is really the best way to go about it. Having the, you know, the institutional knowledge of someone who's been in the department for a long time and then balance that with some uh, fresh ideas. And we try and even, you know, with myself, we have a large network of folks that uh, I communicate with both in the state and outside of the state that are chiefs and uh, try and make sure that we're staying up to date on kind of cutting edge uh, things in the industry, making sure we're trying to implement those that, that fit here in the City. Yeah. Let's talk about the big issue, crime. Um, does not seem to go away. <laughs> as soon as you uh, see things uh, calming down a bit, it seems like the, the cancer returns. How do you um, see the crime dilemma? And the, the department seems to be dealing with a lot of unresolved issues, unresolved, unresolved crimes and th thefts and homicides and shootings. Crime. Yeah, so crime is, is a challenging topic, right? And it's it's something that uh, we collectively need to address. And when I say we collectively, I mean th this community. You know, obviously we're tasked and paid as, as a police department to uh, investigate crime and solve crime. But it's really a community effort. You know, we are not successful as a police department without getting the input, um, the support, and the partnerships from various individuals and businesses and community organizations. So we really rely on uh, those folks to help us and to guide us and provide us with information because you know we are only 174 sworn officers when we're fully staffed we you know we manage uh, about 70,000 calls for service a year give or take uh, over 50 square miles 24 hours a day so it's uh, there's a lot to be done in this city and you know we really have to rely on those folks to to be our partners and to help us uh, as we tackle some of these challenging issues in the city chief how many officers would you ideally need to really do the job I think easily uh, I could support uh, 200 officers, you know, so it's about, you know, 26 additional positions. You know, we've got a lot of things that we do right now that we could do better if we had additional resources. And we also get a lot of inquiries from the community on things they'd like us to do that we just don't have the resources to do. You know, we, we live in a great community that supports, uh, by and large, our police department. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of other things that I think folks would like to see us doing that sometimes we just either can't do to the level that they would like or we can't, in some cases, even do it all just because, you know, our staffing has to be primarily focused on initially 911 calls for service. When you pick up your phone at 2 o'clock in the morning to report a burglary, I've got to have officers that can go to that. And so we got to take care of the need to have things before we take care of the nice to have things. And, uh, you know, we live in a community, again, that, that there's a lot of opportunities here. There's been a lot of growth in this community in the 23 years that I've been here. You know, we've seen uh, the population continue to boom. We've seen a lot of development and a lot of new things come into this community. And I think part of that is certainly the great work that we do as, as a police department to help support that. But 
to, you know, as things grow, we need to continue to expand our, our, our force here so that we can better serve the community and keep up with some of the demands that are, that are brought in with that growth. Mm -hmm. You mentioned your uh, dream number, if you will, of officers. I always wondered, why wouldn't the city say, we're going to give the LPD whatever they need uh, in terms of funding to get those numbers up, um, to get the adequate officers? Because so much hinges on um, crime and safety in the community. We're talking outside corporations that want to come here. Absolutely. We're talking about some of the best of the best wanting to relocate to the city. Just out of curiosity, why, why wouldn't the city say, hey, we're going to make a sacrifice. We're going to get those guys everything they need to keep crime low, to make Lynchburg attractive. Yeah, very good question. Uh, certainly, uh, one a council member could probably answer better than I could. <laughs> but uh, you know, and we do understand. We recognize that they have a, a lot of demands. Uh, they've got a lot of different folks that are coming to them with requests for funding for different things. And uh, you know, the the challenge is, is where do you prioritize the services? Quite honestly, right? And uh, you know, obviously, we're a little bit biased as a police department. You know, we believe that, that law enforcement, public safety, is is one of the things that uh, kind of the the overall success of our community kind of hinges on that. Uh, we think a lot of the other things, if we are doing our job well, um, will help a lot of other departments in the city as well as our community in general do do better at. So, you know, we are one thing, and you already mentioned it, you know, we, I think how we do our job directly ties into economic development. You know, I mean, if we are out there providing safe communities and, you know, when a business is looking to relocate uh, or looking to add jobs to an area, that's one of the things they look at. They usually look at crime numbers and they look at education. And, you know, I think if we're doing our job well, we're going to help on the front of economic development. We're also hopefully going to help on the front of people, you know, willing to move into this city to, to send their kids to school here, you know, because it's a, a safe, safe community. So, you know, I think... It, we don't ever operate in a in a bubble. You know, all the things that we do tie into a lot of the things other folks do, and I think, oh, you know, the role that we serve as a police department is is critical to the overall success of this city, not just from a safety standpoint, but from a, a development and a growth standpoint. So, for those in the community who see these crimes being unresolved at a particular point, what do you say to them again? They're just Ask, they ask me all the time, I'm sure you guys get it, yeah. what happens in this case? What is happening in this case? Sometimes they uh, assume that you guys are kind of laying dormant or has pushed that particular crime to the issue. So once again, to the viewer who has those questions, you say what? I say first and foremost, uh, we need them to be engaged and involved. And uh, we, again, overwhelmingly have a lot of support from our community. But you know, we, we have folks in the community that are in witnessing crimes or no information about a crime we ask them to come forward to us uh, some i recognize don't feel comfortable just calling and having a police officer stand on their front porch and talking to them we have other means that folks can do that through through crime stoppers through our concerned reliable citizens program and other ways that are anonymous so that we understand some people depending on the community they live in may have some fear of hey if i contact the police you know that folks may be coming and looking for me so we want to make sure we can do that and provide ways for them to do that for us safely um, and anonymously when needed and then secondly you know a lot of times it's very I think easy to say well we don't see the police out there doing this and I can promise you that uh, we take all crime that happens here very seriously and we take the limited resources we do have and try and use them as efficiently as we can to address those crimes um, so just because you don't always see something happening um, you know, it doesn't mean we aren't doing things. A lot of times we're building a case kind of behind the scenes. Yeah. We don't want to advertise a lot of what we're doing because we don't want to tip off to, you know, the would-be criminals or the involved uh, suspects what we're doing. But a lot of times some of those cases will come to conclusion after many, many months of investigation. Um, and sometimes they're done with fanfare, sometimes they're not because, you know, it's our experience that sometimes the folks that we arrest um, depending on their level of cooperation may provide additional information um, to help us kind of get a bigger fish so mm. to speak. Chief as you may know I'm from the Hampton Rose area and I got here uh, after transferring from Norfolk State to Liberty University and State and my family always well they used to call Lynchburg Happy Valley, Happy Valley <laughs> because the crime was so low and called me crazy, but back in my younger day, I mean, it, it was nothing for me to fall asleep in my house in the summers with the screen door open, just relaxing and things. No one ever broke into my house, but now things are different. A lot of us do not sleep like that or are more cautious. Here's my question. With the unemployment rate being so low 
Everybody seems to be hiring. There are jobs everywhere. How do you explain or rationalize all, all this crime taking place, especially amongst young people who are so bright and talented? I mean, and then when they get caught, they're facing all of this time, just throwing their lives away. A lot of places are looking for employees. Right. Yeah, so I think uh, it's important to note, you know, overall our crime rate is still one of the lowest it's been in, in the history of our city. Um, you know, we've seen violent crime continue to plummet here, which I'm very grateful for. We've seen a, a real slight uptick in property crime recently, but still overall crime rates uh, comparatively over the last 20 years are historically low here in the city. But to your point, you know, we do have a lot of younger folks be involved in, in, yeah. in more crime. Um, a lot of property crime, especially, a, a lot of these young folks are going around uh, late at night in our community, unfortunately, and they are breaking into cars. Uh, those are often crimes of opportunity, unfortunately, where folks are leaving things either in their cars, uh, like laptops, purses, wallets, things like that, or they're not locking their cars and folks are just going through them and rummaging through them. But I think it's really a bigger societal issue when you talk about our youth, you know, our youth are, they're dealing with things that you and I quite honestly didn't deal with growing up. Uh, we didn't deal with social media growing up. We didn't deal with a lot of the pressures and challenges that, that some of these young men and women are dealing with. And a lot of these folks, as you well know, are, are not being raised in, in two-parent homes. They're not being raised in some cases by any parents. Um, so we've got to find a way as a community to continue to reach out and try and engage those those young men and women at a really early age. And uh, honestly, uh, you know, we we can continue to work with them no matter what the age, but we've got to hit them early. Um, if we're waiting until they're 16 or 17 years old to try and get involved and do some type of intervention, that's that's way too late. We need to be reaching these young men, young women when they're in middle school and, and really helping them understand that, you know, you can be anything you want, right? You know, we need to give them examples of people like Leland Melvin from Lynchburg, right, who went on to be an astronaut and uh, help them understand they can, they can achieve and let somebody know uh, – let some of these young men and women know that someone believes in them. Because uh, a lot of these young men and women have never had somebody hug them or tell them they love them or tell them they could go to college or things like that. So it's our responsibility as a community, yours, mine, and everybody's, to make sure that uh, we provide some hope for these young men and women. And at the same time, help them understand that you know there's some decisions you can make early in your life that could impact you forever. And yeah. uh, we don't want to see that happen to these guys. Let's talk about uh the state of policing today. Um, you mentioned needing more officers, but um, you know a lot of people do not want to be police officers. It seems it seems as though recruiting is becoming more of a challenge. How do you and your department handle these situations where we see of uh, see police officers acting unseemly? Um, does that do you guys see that as some great disadvantage to recruiting? Is it just over there and not here are there bad apples everywhere that's difficult to weed out yeah so so policing is like any other profession right um not everybody in this profession is perfect uh just like not every doctor or every attorney or every pastor is, is perfect you know but by and large uh, especially in lynchburg pd uh, you know we do a very very extensive background uh, we are super, super critical on who we hire here. Uh, I need to be comfortable when I sign off on hiring someone. The two most important things I do here as a police chief is who I hire and who I promote. Um, and when I sign off on someone to hire them to bring them on this police department, I need to do that knowing that I can go to bed at night and sleep comfortably knowing that Officer Johnson or Smith or whoever is out on the street and at 2 in the morning they're going to make the right decision when nobody else is looking. So, um, you know, that's that's a challenge, though. The recruiting, as you said, is, is extremely challenging in today's day and age, and that's not just in Lynchburg. That's across the country for law enforcement, and there's about a million different reasons for that. You know, one, the economy is doing really well right now, and there's a lot of other jobs out there for people sure. to get. So that that's a, a challenge. Uh, <clears throat> we used to see 10 years ago we would see about 2,000 applications a year uh, come through the department. Now we're seeing less than 600. Um, so it's a significant drop off in, in applicants. And again, there's opportunities for people to do other things that maybe there wasn't 10 years ago in terms of the economy. Um, you know, but seeing, the, to your point, those bad apples, uh, the challenge with this profession is, is the actions of just one person can significantly impact this entire profession. And the example I always give, which your generation and mine understand, some of the younger generation may not, but as Rodney King in California, right? You know, Rodney King was, was brutally beaten by some officers out there uh, in the 90s, and uh, I can remember several years after that, 
um, being out on the streets here in Lynchburg and having people make comments about that, you know, towards the police department. So, you know, the actions of one or a couple of, of officers that are out of bounds uh, can impact, you know, someone on the other side of the country here. So it's a challenge to figure out how do we help tell our message and tell our story a little better and help people understand what we do well here as a police department. And, you know, it's not just about writing tickets and arresting people, you know. 70,000 interactions, give or take a year, that we have with our citizens here, and we arrest on average between six to 7,000 people. Okay, so less than 10% of the time that we interact with people, we're actually arresting someone, you know, and helping people understand that our folks are out there, they're volunteering in basketball leagues with young men and women, they're out there teaching kids to play baseball, they're out in the schools reading to kindergarten classes, and they're engaging with all these different organizations to try and help make Lynchburg, you know, a better place to live, work, and play. So it's doing a better job of telling our story really is what we need to do. And that's part of why we hired a, a community relations coordinator and, and Gary Dungan to, to help us tell all the great work that we do as a police department because it doesn't mean we're perfect. It doesn't mean occasionally uh, we have missteps. Um, when that happens, we obviously address those. If it's a training issue, we address it with, uh, through that matter. If it's a, a bigger issue, then you know ultimately the, the only people that hate bad cops more than the public are good cops. Um, so if we've got somebody that, that we think is not um, living up to the standard that we have in Lynchburg PD, then we're, we're going to remove them from the organization so that we can make sure everybody that wears this badge is out there representing us in the most positive manner. And that leads me to my next question. Some citizens, when I you know, put out on social media that I was going to interview the chief, mm -hmm. a lot of them had questions about whether or not uh, blue would turn in other blue, as you mentioned. Uh, they don't believe that happens. They think uh, you guys turn a blind eye to the bad cops, and that's why they're still around. And then when something happens, they say, there it is. Right. And I will tell you that uh, I've seen that happen here several times where officers here have made uh, their supervisors aware of behaviors or activities that officers have conducted uh, wearing this uniform. They're inappropriate, uh, and those have been addressed swiftly. Um, you know, we've... Uh, you know, a lot of the things, obviously, I can't speak directly to personnel-related matters of individual officers, but I can tell you that, uh, you know, I, I take my role as a police chief very, very seriously. And the last thing I want is one of my officers out in the community um, that's not representing us well or that is um, not exercising the utmost professionalism and integrity at any time. So I certainly encourage folks, uh, as always, if, if they know of an officer that's out there doing something that's inappropriate or they haven't treated them well, to please let us know. We, we need to address that and, and make sure that our officers are um, conducting themselves in an appropriate manner. You know, part of the way we, we do that is obviously, you know, we have body cameras now and uh, have for about three years. Uh, all of our officers are issued those, so when they're out there interacting with the public, those uh, interactions are recorded. Uh, we do random audits of those body-worn cameras. So supervisors will go in and randomly pick videos from both the officer's body-worn camera as well as their in-car cameras and just see what's going on. See, is the officer you know, performing their job appropriately? Are they uh, taking the safety steps they need to take to keep themselves and citizens safe? Are they interacting appropriately and talking to citizens in, in a professional manner? And if they're not, we try to address those as quickly as we can. Let's switch and uh, talk a little bit about diversity. When you first got the job, when I asked you, hey, um, what is your plan to bring more minority officers uh, to the force, women, Hispanics, African-Americans, people of color? How are we doing on diversity within the LPD? So an area that quite bluntly, Andre, we, we still uh, struggle with. Um, you know, <clears throat> for all the same reasons, regardless of race or gender that you mentioned a few minutes ago, why people may not be getting into this line of work or want to get into this line of work, I think that that crosses all genders, all ethnicities, all races, right? Uh, it's not just, oh, well, minorities don't want to get into police work because of X. There's a lot of people across the spectrum that don't want to because of X. You know, one of our challenges is, is trying to make sure that people understand that, you know, this job uh, creates a lot of challenges in your personal life. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it really does. It, uh, you know, it is very taxing uh, on not just the officers that we hire. I always say the, the hardest job in America is not being a police officer, it's being a family member of a police officer because they put up with a lot of stuff. So trying to find folks that have that support system at home, we're going to certainly support them here and make them part of our family when we hire them here, but they've got to have a support system outside. So part of what we're trying to do is continue to engage with folks in our community, um, you know, like yourself and, and some of our inner city pastors uh, who know, hey, I know Susie or John or Billy or Andre or whoever, 
that person would make a good police officer and then mm -hmm. trying to pull them in and sit down and, and you know have one-on-one -on -one conversations with them and you know help them understand what it is we do because I think everybody has an idea of what they think a police officer does right much like I probably have an idea of what I think you do as a profession but I probably know about maybe 10 or 15 percent of what you do on a day-to-day -day basis to, to do your job so we need to really make sure we're educating our folks um, so they know up front what they're getting into because uh, we what we don't want is someone to get in and three months into the job oh this isn't for me we want to tell them all the good bad and ugly right up front make sure they understand that and we're going to continue to reach out um, through uh, all those different avenues through our current officers are some of our best recruiters. Uh, you know, we have a young lady, uh, Tarika Grooms, who's one of our officers here. I know you may know Tarika, and I'll tell you what, she's a recruiting machine, <laughs> and uh, you know, and that's helpful because you know, with Tarika being a minority, it's a little bit different for me to go reach out to a minority and say, "Hey, come join the LPD." I understand. Well, I've not grown up as a minority, so I don't understand all the things that someone who has, right? So having folks like Tarika, who's a great recruiter for us, to be able to go out there and, and share her experience and maybe some, quite honestly, her concerns with, hey, when I thought about joining Lynchburg PD, here was kind of some of my concerns, but this is what I found, right? And this is how I interact, and this is how I value what this job brings to me. And so I think having folks like that, she does an exceptional job, and she's one of several that, that do that. So we're going to keep uh, doing that. We're going to keep asking folks in the community. And my biggest ask every time I speak to anybody in the community is always, please, if you know someone who you think would make a good police officer, someone that you trust, someone that has integrity, someone that you f would feel comfortable at 2 in the morning when your house is broken into, if they showed up on your front doorsteps and you thought with the right training they could handle themselves, those are the kind of people we want to be referred to us. So, you know, that's my ask always is, uh, especially on the, on the minority and gender uh, sides of things. You know, we still struggle with having enough women and certainly having enough officers uh, who are minorities. So if you know folks like that, that my encouragement to our community is to send them our way. We'd love to make them a part of the LPD and then have them uh, serve our community better. But in terms of you being the chief, and uh, let's talk about your command staff. Now, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but you have a great hand in selecting the command staff. Correct. So when we see no African Americans, people of color in that command staff, does that send a bad message to those younger officers who are great recruiters that you mentioned? Do they need to see people who look like them uh, in that command staff that you handpicked? Right. So definitely, yeah. The, the more they can see, hey, there's an avenue or an opportunity there for me, certainly that helps out. Um, you know, I will tell you that uh, the further up the food chain, so to speak, you go in, in the command staff, uh, the more demands there are um, and the less interest we have across, quite honestly, all races, all genders. Um, you know, obviously the pool thins because, you know, to be a captain, you have to have been a lieutenant first. To be a lieutenant, you have to have been a sergeant first and so on. Uh, so, you know, one of the things we need to make sure we're doing as an organization is trying to prepare folks um, to be willing, first and foremost, to take on that added level of responsibility. And then after being willing, certainly we want to prepare folks to make sure that they have um, the training behind them and what we would call a diversity of assignment. So we want to make sure that, you know, we're not just taking someone who started as a patrol officer, then they became a patrol sergeant, then they became a patrol lieutenant, then they became a patrol captain, right? We want folks that have worked in different areas of the department to get a better feel for what we do as an organization. Um, you know, I can tell you that many, many years ago in my career, when I moved over to our criminal investigations division, I had never worked there as a detective. I went in there as, as one of the lieutenants. Um, and it was eye-opening to me. I thought I knew what we did uh, as an investigations unit. And, what a soundbite. I and, thought I knew what we and did. And I will tell you what, it was, uh, it was very, uh, very eye-opening to me. I, I learned a lot over there. I was mentored uh, over there uh, by one of my subordinates. Uh, it was Rodney Carson who did a really great job of mentoring me and helping me understand what was important over there and what wasn't. Um, so I think we've got to make sure we get uh, all folks, and certainly folks uh, – uh, in our department that, that are uh, either gender um, minorities or racial minorities into positions to, to prepare them to best um, at least be positioned so that if they choose to, to put in for those assignments uh, or those promotions to higher rank that uh, they're qualified and ready and able to, to step into there. So yeah, that's an area we still, still need to work on, so no doubt about that. Last point. When the Chicago Bulls wanted Michael Jordan, <laughs> they went all out to get him. 
I mentioned getting funding uh, from the city to get you the office you need, officers you needed. Okay. It seems to me, now I could be wrong, I don't know exactly what you guys do, okay. but if I want the Michael Jordan, if I want a diverse police force, I'm going to make it my business to make it happen. So I'm going to do some extra extraordinary things to make that happen because it's, it sends such a broad message for the community. Right. Right when you guys do all that you could to get Michael Jordans, to get minorities, women, Hispanics, African Americans in the force and in the command staff. Yeah, so I think it's an ongoing challenge. Uh, there's a lot of competing demands. Uh, you know, when you talk about going to council, for example, um, you know, the bottom line at council is always money. I mean, that's that's just the nature of the business they do, uh, and it's balancing uh, me knocking on their door for X amount of dollars to increase staffing or increase uh, whatever implements we may put in place to recruit. It could be a signing bonus. It could be whatever, right? Uh, and so there's always a dollar figure attached to that, and you know. My challenge is, is trying to make sure that they understand the, the priority uh, of what we have, where we're at, where we need to be. Um, you know, the last thing I want to ever see for this city is it to start to spiral downward. And we've seen that with, with other cities not too far from here as well as around the nation where, you know, there's not been that investment in the, the public safety infrastructure, for lack of better terms, to ensure that we have all the resources we need to continue to provide a, a high level um, service that we do I think each and every day to this community so part of my challenge as a, as a chief is to make sure that they understand that need um, that I am pushing that to them as much as I can and helping them um, at least come to a realization that what we do and I think they understand this uh, but what we do as a police department impacts so many other things it's not just about safety it really isn't that's a part of what we do but it impacts so many other things in the community so you know we'll continue to to kind of fight that fight we've got uh, upcoming budgets uh, that'll be due in uh i guess a little over a month or so uh that'll be submitted and then the budget process as you know will get started and uh, they'll start to kind of sort through all the all the cards they're dealt and figure out uh, what needs to rise to the top and in my hope uh, obviously i'm a little bit uh, um selfish in this but my hope is that our needs in the police department uh, rise up towards the top of the of the pile and, uh, and get addressed and uh, hopefully that allow us to better better serve the community so to get off of this point for higher ups in the city that I uh, have interviewed here a few days ago <laughs> who say well Ryan has never talked about um, uh, a great emphasis on minority recruiting when they when he comes to us are they missing something or misinformed or i can't say i've directly spoke to them because i have a boss i speak to which is the city manager obviously and uh, you know the way that happens is I, I share with the city manager the majority of the needs of the of the department and some of our challenges and then uh, you know if there's a time where i'm asked to speak on things but council certainly would speak to them but you know the majority of my uh, direct conversation is through, is through the city manager who then obviously she works for for city council and shares that whether it's through the budget process or through any other means so you have spoken to the city manager about the great need for diversity and how you want that kind of yeah, force. We, we, we've spoken at, at length about okay. that, yeah, over the year. And But honestly, prior to me being chief, I mean, that's something that she's aware of, obviously, and, and I think uh, everybody's aware of, I hope. You know, I mean, this is not something that we try and keep a secret, right? This is something that the more people know about it, the, the better off uh, we are, ultimately. And it's uh, my hope is that people that are hopefully watching this show will say, hey, you know what? I know somebody that uh, would be a great candidate for the Lynchburg Police Department. I'm going to give them a call and, and see if I can encourage them to at least pick up the phone or come down here and talk to us. You know, no no harm, no foul there, right? At least come down. You might look at it and say it's not for you, but uh, you might look at it and say, wow, this is, this is something I could see myself doing. You know, my, Ryan, uh, my job is to ask difficult questions sometimes regardless of my relationship with folks. You know, right. you and I go back a long way. Yes, sir. Somehow you kept all your hair. <laughs> That's one thing I'm mad about. It's a little grayer. I don't know. You and Greg, the fire department. I'm like, how did those guys keep all of that hair? Yeah. But I digress. I agree. For those who say, well, right here, you're making too big of a deal out of minority hiring and recruitment and the command staff. And, you know, officers have a tough enough job. They are doing fine and that is not an issue or not should be an issue to those because people have even told me that so for those who have that view you say what uh, you know here's the reality uh, the very simple reality is this is we need to better reflect our community um, we don't do that right now from both gender uh, and racial diversity um, and I think 
The reality is, is we have a lot of challenges in our community uh, with poverty and with some other things. Um, a lot of those are the poverty issues are disproportionately represented in the minority community. And I think for folks to be able to look at someone that shows up at their front door, <coughs> excuse me, and it's someone that looks like them may have shared experiences with them, you know. I don't have experiences growing up as a minority just like you don't have experience growing up as a Caucasian. So I can sit and research and read and sit down and talk to you and share experience as much as I can, but those are still just stories and those are just shared experiences that you may have had that you have shared with me. That's not me living that. So I think to be able to reflect our community better, to have a better representation of minorities, better representation of women on our force, I think ultimately we're going to be a better police department, we're going to serve our community better, and hopefully that's going to build some stronger trust and some, a better legitimacy within our community.